Uh, well, thank you, Ahim. And uh, I mean, it's it's quite interesting to hear you also say it's like you know you're not jumping from from one crisis to the next and get sort of lost in the middle of it. But you see the big picture, the, the long game there, which especially now in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, is is some sort of of comfort to know that uh, you're not losing sight of what's at stake. Uh, and of course, that also goes for Denis. You mentioned him already, and it is a bit. More than uh, a year ago now that the tripartite uh, agreement was signed uh, on the sidelines of the Climate Action Summit in New York, I remember it well. Uh, now, in this little bit more than a year, Denis, what would you say were the biggest achievements or challenges in this period of time? Over to you. Thank you, Monica. First, I'd like to thank the ministers for having me again on this uh, high-level consultative group. Uh, in just one year, I believe we've made tremendous progress with uh, uh, concrete results already delivered. As Eduardo mentioned, we have launched our first project to create a flood and earthquake uh, insurance program for the for Peru's public schools. This has the potential to cover up to 50,000 public schools and to increase the school's resilience over time. It will incorporate, uh, as Eduardo indicated, build back better elements into the program design, as well as an ex-ante approach for the uh, uh, procurement uh, to, to uh, reconstruction. Uh, it will also leverage uh, innovative image recognition technologies as a key part of managing data for those uh, public assets, as well as accelerating uh, claims handling. It also sets the course, for se the course for securing other public assets such as hospitals, bridges, and roads. And uh, Eduardo mentioned uh, two uh, uh, um, two important reasons why the IDF was uh, was picked. I think there is a third element. I mean, we, we do have the necessity to involve the local in association of insurers, as Eduardo uh, is here to say, but also there is a need to, uh, I would say, uh, diversify the risk and uh, the per Peruvian insurers uh, on their own could not do that. We need a much uh, more global approach for the, uh, for the uh, spread of risk. This project is the most advanced, but behind the scenes, as uh, uh, Ahim indicated earlier, uh, we are working incredibly hard to accelerate the pipeline of the uh, 20 next uh, promising idea projects. UNDP offices uh, across 21 countries have been mobilized and discussions are underway with many of these governments to identify their risk management and financing needs and how insurance can help. UNDP country office teams are being educated on how risk transfer can catalyze critical disaster risk management, how insurance risk modeling can feed into uh, UNDP climate processes with governments, and finally, what a powerful tool insurance is in managing government's budget variety. The, the German government, uh, BMZ, the Ministry of uh, uh, Cooperation and Development, has uh, delivered on its commitment to provide 20 million of uh, financing to support the delivery by 20 million of uh, financial assistance and has pledged to increase its financial support to this end. And insurance companies have been mobilized on these uh, concrete development projects with uh, more than 50 people already from uh, across the IDF member companies mobilized. They are the leading insurance re insurers, reinsurers and brokers in the field of natural catastrophes. Uh, we are also financing open source risk modeling tools and co-investing with BMZ in the financing of the technical assistance program. And uh, again, I repeat, we have put uh, at the disposal of the program more than 5 billion US dollars of insurance and reinsurance capacity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Denis. So, um, it's quite impressive. I mean, uh, I said just a little bit over a year, but it's only a little bit over a year and so much has already gone underway. So uh, bravo, kudos to that. Uh, I would like to switch the focus from the tripartite agreement to the Global Risk Financing Facility. And that was announced two years ago uh, at the World Bank's annual meeting in Bali. Uh, and for that, I would like to bring in uh, Sami Nagui Uwaba now. Uh, so please tell me, um, what concrete lessons uh, have you learned from the projects on the ground? Uh, example, Sub-Saharan Africa. Sami, over to you now. Um, thank you, Monica, and a pleasure for me to be here. So uh, indeed, since uh, the GRIF or the Global Risk Financing Facility was announced in 2018, 
by the World Bank with the two uh, main donors, the German Federal uh, Ministry of Economic Development, of Economic Cooperation, BMZ, and the uh, Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, FCDO, formerly uh, DFID. Uh, since then, uh, the GRIF has allocated funds to 10 countries and we have in sub-Saharan Africa active projects in uh, Malawi, in Mozambique, and in Sierra Leone. Um, and it also allocated a group of uh, global public goods uh, type of grants to address key research and analytical uh, gaps. So for instance, in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, the GRIF is supporting the government to design a pre-arranged shock responsive safety net that scales up when disaster strike. And among other things, it's putting together technical assistance to build and strengthen governance and data systems. In Mozambique, it's co-financing a $90 million World Bank operation that has helped finance uh, and finalize regulations for Mozambique's first disaster management fund. And the, uh, we are supporting the government of Mozambique to select an appropriate sovereign risk uh, finance instrument to provide protection against the infrequent large-scale events. And it's also in developing a cyclone risk model and designing and placing a risk uh, transfer product. Now, and, and after that, uh, with uh, financing on a declining uh, basis of three years worth of corresponding insurance premium. Now, we've learned maybe many lessons, but let me highlight quickly three. The first is that it's clear that long-term engagement with the partner countries is key. I mean, many of these, I mean, the engagement has taken place over the long haul, and it's a continuous dialogue on disaster risk financing and insurance. So for instance, again, in Mozambique, you know, it, for the past eight years, the government has been working with the World Bank for increasing financial protection against disasters by designing and implementing a disaster risk financing strategy. And this led to a commitment of $36 million of government funds you know, to the uh, World Bank operation, including annual budget allocations for the disaster management fund. Again, these things happen when you engage over the long term. The second lesson is about technical assistance. It is fundamental for successful implementation of financial solutions in the countries. I mean, so the governments continue to request significant technical support to designing these financing instruments and sustained capacity building to implement them as well. These instruments, as you can imagine, can often be complex and required lots of customization uh, to their design. Again, in Mozambique and Sierra Leone, we have sustained technical assistance. In the case of Mozambique, it's $2 million of ongoing TA to design the sovereign insurance scheme. The last lesson I wanted to share with you is that governments want flexible financial solutions and systems that can adapt and respond to different shocks and crises. So, of course, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of having such as agile and flexible systems that can be restructured to respond to emerging crises. So, again, in Sierra Leone and Mozambique, the teams were quick to reorient the funds available to design the systems needed to facilitate the shock response. In Sierra Leone, we had contingent IDA funds that were held in reserves, and these were mobilized as emergency cash transfers to reach the vulnerable groups much faster than the regular safety nets, which was still being restructured to mobilize for uh, the emergency. So again, that demonstrates the value of pre-arranged finance, but also pre-arranged flexible finance. Back to you, Monica. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sami Nagribuapa, there for uh, uh, these examples there, for uh, the work you're doing there in, as part of the Global Risk Financing Facility. Um, and uh, just to round, uh, it out this this uh, first round. I would now like to cross over to Jürgen Zattler um, and uh, focus again on the tripartite agreement. I mean, why has Germany decided to, to partner with both the UNDP and the IDF uh, in this quite unique public-private partnership? Uh, Jürgen Zattler, over to you. Yes, thank you, Monica. And uh, your question, I think it's a good one. It has to do with um, very complex risk situations. We are talking about compound risks where different facets of risks come together and interact with each other. So it's a, it's a complex uh, challenge we are facing. And there we 
we need also a setup which is uh, slightly more complex. Uh, so we need uh, all kind of, of expertise. We need public finance. We, we need uh, private risk capital. We need uh, convening power. Uh, we need country expertise. Uh, and therefore, um, we decided uh, to go towards uh, these kind of partnerships. Uh, so in particular with UNDP and, and IDF. Um, with the um, UK and the World Bank, uh, we is established the Global Risk Financing uh, Facility. With UNDP and IDF, uh, we work through the tripartite agreement, uh, as you know. Uh, and we will now begin uh, implementation uh, in the tripartite uh, priority countries. Um, so those uh, countries will, will benefit from, from risk financing and we will co-finance uh, these, um, uh, these uh, measures uh, through the Insu Resilience uh, Solution uh, Fund. So that's uh, the approach. In order to deal with those uh, issues, as I said, we need many partners on board with their respective uh, strengths. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen, for this uh, very concise and to the point answer uh, to my question. Uh, I just give you a brief update on the time. Uh, we now have a good 10 minutes left for the second round. Um, I think it would make sense, first of all, to ask you if you have any comments or questions uh, for the other panelists, something you would like to ask or comment that you've heard before. If so, then please do raise your hand just like that. I will see that because I have you all on the screen. And as I can't see you raise your hand, I would like to ask all of you one question which uh, should allow you uh, to share all the input that you feel you would like to share with us in the remaining time. Uh, and it should allow you to do so. Uh, that final question that for this one uh, second round is, I mean, from your perspective, and obviously uh, looking at the tripartite agreement and uh, the global risk financing facility, all those tools, um, what does success look like for you? What, how would it, uh, how would it manifest itself? And uh, what is still standing in its way? What is missing? So this is the question. And uh, I can't see Abu uh, Kokofele. He has his uh, video not activated, but I think he's still here with us. Uh, I would like to start with him. So Abu, there you are. So please tell me, from your perspective, what does success look like? What is success? And what is standing in its way, looking at the Global Risk Financing Facility and the Tripartite Agreement? Over to you, Abu. You will have to activate your microphone. We can see you, but we cannot hear you right now. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to start by thanking Sami for his uh, presentation, which included comments on Sierra Leone. I think that's actually excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for us, with respect to the question, what we mean by success, um, basically is um, the ability to have uh, um, pre-financing uh, 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 for contingency kept aside and also increased capacity of our uh, response mechanisms to ensure that we are able to more rapidly respond in situations like uh, uh, the mudslide, uh, which happens like overnight and the following morning, you have a huge number of people um, 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 in, in suddenly in need of support. If we have uh, uh, a standby funding and uh, a, a solid uh, response mechanism to be able to respond rapidly, that is what success is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very much to the point. I thank you for that answer. Thank you so much for this. Uh, and uh, I would like to move on now to Eduardo. Same question. Very interested in your answer. Monica, uh, of course, uh, success in our case is to move uh, from the from the current uh, status quo. Uh, right now, we had the money, 
and we were not able to uh, reconstruct uh, uh, on a on a proper time. So uh, if we can be able to reconstruct um, whatever uh, gets uh, broken after the next uh, uh, disaster, uh, much, much faster, that means kids are going to be back in school on a proper school, on a much safer school, uh, that will be fantastic. If we can, uh, if this program is, is uh, uh, finally uh, of the interest of the government, uh, we actually uh, consider that our measure of success is that the government actually asks uh, all of us to move the same uh, type of program to roads or uh, to hospitals. Um, the major challenge, uh, uh, and I think is, is, is something that is um, right now uh, quite dramatic for Peru, but is uh, always present in any uh, emerging country, is that uh, we have had uh, in the last years a lot of political instability. I have to discuss this project with five uh, ministers of finance, with four ministers of education in the last four years. Uh, so uh, that is uh, uh, much harder uh, because this is a very complex project and you have to explain all the tiny details to all of these public uh, 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 officials. So this is something that is always going to be a challenge to deploy uh, one of these uh, uh, projects. Thanks. Thank you, Eduardo, for this. Uh, and with that, uh, moving straight to Achim Steiner there. Uh, success and what still stands in the way, please. So I mean, answer in two ways. One is obviously the, the wonderful partnership that Germany and BMZ have um, helped to bring together with, with this tripartite agreement and, and the catalytic funding. I think we have the countries, the timelines, and uh, clearly the biggest challenge will be to arrive at a point where you know, the insurance industry is also engaged in countries that are of higher risk, where regulatory environments are not as mature yet. And I think this is obviously one of the experiences that Denis and I have also um, observed with other partners that, you know, there are countries where it's easier to move forward and there are others where it's more difficult. But I think we are, uh, in that sense, an incubator. A second part is um, one of the things that I think has been so fascinating is we are coming from very different um, worlds, in a sense. We're dealing with one world, but operate in very seemingly different worlds. The world of government as a regulator, uh, a development organization that looks at an industry in a different way or a service industry such as the insurance industry, and then people from within the insurance industry themselves, different language, different horizons, different rationales. And I think the, the wonderful thing that would be a success is to incubate um, a new culture of co-creation, of thinking together, and particularly for governments. And I end on that example. I think what is, to me, particularly critical, we need to foster an ecosystem in that world of regulation that moves beyond regulating a sector to fostering an ecosystem where, where different actors can tackle a shared problem. You know, I'm, I'm the son of farmers. I grew up in, in, uh, on a farm, and one of the fascinating things in the years that my parents then had a farm in Germany is that you know, the issue of extreme weather events many, many decades ago in Germany was already tackled when hail, hail is something that can literally within, you know, just half an hour destroy a year's harvest. It was too expensive um, to have a few farmers only have hail insurance. So the German government stepped in and established a law that every farmer essentially had to take up hail insurance um, every year. That brought the premium down significantly, made it affordable and essentially provided a safety net for every farmer in Germany when hail um, you know, would destroy your crop. And um, this very real experience accompanies me to this day. It's a good example of how can regulation, how can smart uh, market creation actually bring the best of an insurance industry and a public uh, interest issue together. And that's precisely what we're working on here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Achim Steiner, especially also for this very tangible, visual example that we can all relate to. Uh, Denny de Bern, I mean, obviously, the insurance industry is always at the heart of uh, managing risks. Uh, looking at the, uh, the tripartite agreement and uh, Griff, um, both still very fairly young tools there. Where do you see success? What is success and what's still needed for it? Denny, over to you. Uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, first, 
uh, I have to, to uh, say that uh, we are we are operating in the in a world where COVID is still in everyone's minds, and uh, and COVID has been uh, both a uh, reinforcement of the fact that risk is present and we need to protect against risk, but also a, dist a major distraction. Uh, both because it has occupied uh, all the energy and minds of the uh, public officials and also the largely the private sector for uh, the last uh, nine months, but also it has drawn on the uh, financial abilities of uh, many governments and therefore adding some financing for insurance uh, has become more difficult. The second difficulty uh, which was mentioned by Eduardo was this issue of political stability. And uh, ever since we've started uh, the uh, IDF, uh, this issue of uh, political stability has been, uh, has been a challenge. So what does success look like and what is missing? Uh, I would say, uh, for me, success looks like uh, we have uh, a program in place in the 20 countries of the, uh, of the tripartite agreement. But it also uh, means that we would have the first payments and the first reconstructions showing that the uh, tripartite effectively uh, works and that insurance uh, is a is a good uh, is a good so is a good solution uh, that allows better and faster reconstruction after the event and third uh, i think the uh, success means also that uh, we understand everyone understands that uh, the various tools that are at our disposal both public and private sector are, are fully aligned and the, ver the various initiatives are aligned to really build on each other's expertise, knowledge and progress. And the, the various tools are not seen as competitive, co I mean, tools coming in competition with each other, but complementary tools to address this issue of, uh, of risk uh, and finance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denny. We have uh, two more panelists uh, to comment on what success looks like and what is still missing. And I'd first like to go with uh, Sami. You've given us such uh, brilliant examples already of the projects uh, uh, that you were involved in. But uh, what exactly does success look like for you and what is missing for it? Sami, over to you. Um, thanks, Monica. So I, I fully agree with Eduardo. I think success is the moment you have mobilized this financing is that it get, get actually expanded effectively and efficiently without delays. Because if we've done all this, and then you're unable to respond to the crisis with that prearranged, flexible financing, then we've got something really wrong. Uh, but since, you know, he's mentioned this, let me talk about maybe an intermediate level of success, which is scaling up private sector participation. So, you know, right now, for instance, in some of the work that we're doing uh, in providing support uh, with to the uh, famine action mechanism as part of the GRIF, you know, mobilizing private sector firms, technology firms, so that you can uh, bring in, you know, artificial intelligence towards the development of the state-of-the-art technologies uh, for models that could link, you know, early warning systems um, to identify when food crises could threaten to be turning into famines, uh, mobilizing also investors to be able to transfer famine risk to the market. So creating a large ecosystem of the private sector to help us advance on new innovative products would be, if you want, a more... Uh, manageable goal that I would like to see us uh, focus on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sami. And last but not least, we have uh, Jürgen Zattler there. Please share with us your idea of success and the hurdles on the way. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, so with regard to the success, uh, of course, uh, I could say we, we have some, uh, you know, benchmarks and objectives. This is in particular from the German side uh, to enroll more people in risk financing and in risk uh, insurance. But I think it, it goes beyond uh, that. Uh, we all know that um, when you look at at countries' experiences, uh, development experiences, you can very often see rapid growth, rapid uh, income uh, generation, rapid reduction in, in poverty. But what you see also is there are very, very often setbacks. And in those setbacks, capital is destroyed, social capital is destroyed. That's what you see at the moment. And it takes a long time until you reach uh, the the level of, of social, environmental uh, and human capital you have had before. So I think that's a, a broader uh, benchmark for, for success. With regard to what's missing, 
uh, I would say, I mean, we are working with all kinds of instruments and it takes a long time. So we need different instruments for different risks and we are just at the beginning, but uh, it will take time and we will work on that. Um, but I think there is also a more general point. Achim mentioned uh, regulation. So it's not only about, you know, individual financing. It goes beyond that. We have to mainstream, in a way, uh, resilience into what we are doing and also in development strategies. Uh, we know about those setbacks and uh, therefore I think we, our whole, you know, development approach and philosophy has to change um, because we are faced with more and more of those uh, challenges with crisis and crises are happening in more frequency. So we have to build that in. And this has many, many implications for our development advice. Um, for example, for the World Bank <laughs> Summit. Um, and um, we also have to build it into our instruments. Uh, and uh, this means going all through the instruments. For example, I used to work with the World Bank until three weeks ago. We established the crisis response window. But it's only, you know, to come in when the crisis happened. We have to, to build into the crisis response window resilience. So we have to go all through all those instruments and to mainstream also a resilience uh, into all our instruments. Well, thank you so much. I have to say there was a, a lot of food for thought there, a lot of input, and uh, it was great seeing and hearing all of you. It would have been even better if it had happened in a room on a stage, uh, but uh, I'm so happy that we could get it done at least this way digitally. So thank you so much, Eduardo, Abu, Achim, Denis, uh, Jürgen, uh, Sattler, and uh, Samu. Um, so good to have you all with us and uh, i would like to move on to the next session timing was great but input was even better and i think this is important so thank you very much we have uh, one more input now and uh, this time focusing on the re re uh, relevance of financial protection for micro small and medium-sized enterprises to achieve the objectives of the financial protection agenda uh, and uh, we will get this input from the Secretary Maybelline Andon Bing from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and she sent us a video message. So let's listen to that now. Speak at the forum and a good morning, afternoon, or evening to our distinguished speakers and all the members of the Insur Resilience Global Partnership. My name is Maybelline Andon Bing, and I am the Secretary of Finance of the Marshall Islands, the current V20 co-chair of the high-level consultative group. After hearing from the Global Risk Financing Facility and the tripartite agreement about their action on the ground, we are now transitioning into the second part of day one to take a closer look into the solutions the partnership should leverage in order to accelerate progress in our objectives. In V20 countries, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs, contribute between 20 to 70% of GDP, constitute more than 80% of all the businesses, and contribute to the country's export revenue. They are important drivers of social economic growth, arguably a key prerequisite for resilience and government revenue. At the same time, MSMEs and not only agricultural ones, are often particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events due to smaller human and financial resources, information asymmetries, and the cost of resilience measures. Adequate insurance offerings to protect MSMEs are, however, often unavailable, and so far, very few projects focus on climate smart insu insurance specifically for MSMEs. Non-life insurance penetration in V20 economies, typically indicative of the degree to which private sector is covered, mostly lies below 1%. The V20 Sustainable Insurance Facility, or the SIF, is envisaged as a project pipeline development facility to add to the current risk financing architecture by driving forward the number of implementation projects that enhance MSME's access to climate smart insurance. Operationally, the SIF is intended to be implemented through a dedicated project office 
hosted in a V20 partner institution. The task of this office will focus on two items, including one, developing project proposals jointly with the V20 members and relevant stakeholders, and two, implementing those through identified implementation organizations and with the financial support of dedicated risk finance funds, such as the Asia Pacific Climate Finance Fund, ACLIF, under the Asian Development Bank, who have committed support to the V20. As such, the CIF aims to mobilize international financial and technical assistance. The objective is to stimulate climate smart insurance offerings by domestic and regional insurers to protect MSMEs and the poor and vulnerable that rely on them. Thematically, any CIF sponsored project has to address specific product and implementation requirements as set out in the CIF action areas. The exact definition of what constitutes MSMEs often varies, but microenterprises usually have one to five, sometimes 10 employees, small businesses 10 to 50, and medium-sized enterprises up to 300 employees. In V20 countries, the livelihoods of large population segments depend on them. Here, MSMEs make up for 40 to 90% of employment. This puts MSMEs in a unique role in which they aggregate large group of population and thereby provide the ability to reach many people, owners, employees, or small family owned businesses directly or indirectly with insurance. In contrast to larger corporations, MSMEs also more frequently hire lower skilled workers and women thus supporting particularly vulnerable population segments and also providing an avenue for the development of human capital. Designing and developing insurance products in collaboration with MSMEs while simultaneously building their risk management capacities can therefore be a powerful opportunity to train and inform entrepreneurs and their employers, employees on the financial literacy, climate risk literacy, and business planning skills. As such, MSMEs can be as important aggregators offering an entry point for leveraging progress towards achieving the partnership's 500 million protection target, contributing to human development and realizing its gender declaration. The CIF's integrated approach can also foster progress on other agendas such as MSME finance, financial inclusion, and sustainable supply chain management. With MSMEs being the backbone of the V20 economies, the V20 kickoff, the CIF under the leadership of Marshall Islands in 2019. In 2020, the CIF initiated the first implementation step in the Philippines with the support of the Munich Climate Insurance in Initiative, functioning as the interim CIF project office and ACLIF. Over the course of 2021, CIF implementation is also planned to commence in Bangladesh, Fiji, and the Marshall Islands. The Philippines is widely regarded as one of the world's most disaster-prone countries, and MSMEs make a significant contribution to the country's economy, the livelihood of lower-income groups, and account for 52% of employment. The goal is twofold. One, to develop an insurance cooperative disaster insurance product bundled with savings or credit instruments. And two, to build the risk management capacities of MSMEs through advisory services. Leveraging the expertise and reach of aggregators such as actors within the supply chain and insurance cooperatives can help the insurance product reach scale to sustainable level. This makes them well positioned to build broad product distribution and training in support of the partnership's objectives. And catering to MSMEs, we hope this will help build the scale we need to reach the ambitious objective of insure resilience. Of course, we will have to overcome many challenges to get there, including a lack of regulation, consumer protection, and a tailored product offering taxes, incentives, and effective distribution channels. Equally, Climate risk and their prospective financial impacts are often unknown or well, not well understood by the MSMEs. And those MSMEs that are aware frequently lack the capital included through credit access and business planning skills to invest in risk reduction and formulate disaster response strategies. 
These competencies are, however, essential not only to make insurance cost effective, but also for MSMEs and people to better understand why they would need insurance and what for. The partnership gathers a tremendous amount of expertise and motivation to move forward. A working, and working together, we can ideate, innovate, and realize the solution we need to make vulnerable people and economies more resilient. Thank you, Excellencies, and everyone who has joined us here today to make sure we drive progress. For our annual forum, I wish you all fruitful and exciting exchanges that will help you to take further meaningful steps over the coming years. Komoltada. Thank you. And that was uh, the Secretary Maybelline Andon Bing from the Republic of Marshall Islands. Their video message on the importance of MSMEs when it comes to achieving the objectives of the financial protection agenda. So thank you very much and uh, greetings uh, to the Marshall Islands as well. Well, so what are the key steps then to achieving Vision 2025? What are the promising solutions? What are the challenges ahead? And how to scale up action? Well, all of these are questions I would now like to discuss with our next panel. And I hope they're all here, uh, all ready to say hello. I would like to welcome Ibrahima Sidiong, uh, United Nations Assistant Secretary General and Director General of African Risk Capacity Group there. Good Again afternoon. You. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. I would also like to welcome Stefano Signore. And if you've looked at the program earlier, uh, he uh, takes the place today of uh, Carla Montesi, who couldn't join us. But Stefano Signore is uh, head of uh, Unit uh, Sustainable Energy and Climate at the European Commission in Brussels. I'm very happy to have him with us, and I hope he's here Hello. with us as well. Hello. Hello. Good, good to have you with us. And last but not least, uh, I would also like to welcome Paola Alvarez, Assistant Secretary at the Department of Finance of the Philippines. So I hope you're with us as well, Paola. Yes, we from our side of the Philippines. So nice to see you again. Okay. okay, here we are. Well, good to have you all here. So uh, we do the same as before. So everyone who speaks obviously needs his microphone activated. You can leave your picture activated. So it's good to know that you're still here. Uh, but if you don't speak, keep your microphone on mute because there's always some uh, interference otherwise. And I would actually like to start with you, Paola, because we just heard in this video message uh, from Maybelline uh, Andon Bing that uh, the Philippines is one of the most disaster grown countries in the world. Uh, the Philippines is also one of the few countries that's implemented a multi-layered disaster risk finance strategy and uh, it is working on different solutions to build resilience for poor and vulnerable people to climate shocks. How do you, or how does the Philippines align its investment and disaster risk financing agendas to reach its, its uh, objectives there? And uh, what can other into resilience members perhaps learn, Paola, uh, I would say we have uh, four to five minutes for the first answer. Off you go. With, with microphone, is the microphone activated? Because I can't hear you right now. That sounds promising. <laughs> Oh no, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. Keep we, we I leave my microphone on and you just keep talking. Let's let's see if we can solve this. Okay. So actually just to October to November of 2020, three typhoons successively devastated the Philippines. And it was actually two super typhoons out of three. And maybe I'll just leave. Is that better? Yes, yes, sometimes it helps. Uh, the bandwidth isn't strong enough. So we just listened to you. We saw you, Paola. Now we just listened. So, actually, just October to November 2020 alone, we had already three super typhoons successively devastating the Philippines. And it incurred around 10 billion pesos in agriculture sector damages and 25 billion in the infrastructure sector. And this is with just one typhoon. Now, what we wanted to do with the SIF is actually to help 
as the finance minister of Marshall Islands noted, how do we help micro, small, and medium enterprises become more resilient to the effects of um, of, of the of climate change? Now, in the Philippines, what we did initially to counter the effects or mitigate the disaster risks posed by the changing climate is to impose a layered type of um, insurance. So we did a strategy wherein we have three layers. We have the national level, we have the local level, and we have the individual level. So for the national level, we deployed different kinds of tools, such as um, catastrophe deferred drawdown loans. We actually have three of those. We have one from the World Bank, one from ADB, and one from JICA. We also floated recently catastrophe bonds, and this is with the U.S. Treasury. We also have different indemnity insurance products at the national level. We also created um, an asset registry system for us to take note of all of government assets. We also have a budget tagging system for us to um, monitor how much appropriations from our Congress is actually allocated to climate change, disaster risks, and adaptation and mitigation. As, uh, aside from that, on our local level, our local governments are also mandated to allocate a certain portion of their internal revenue allotment budget towards uh, a disaster fund or an emergency facility. And unfortunately, although the provinces already have this facility, just at the beginning of the year, COVID has already drawn out the funds within these um, emergency funds. So when disaster strikes, like for example, when the typhoons happened, when the floodings happened, and when certain parts are uh, have drought, certain parts of the country have drought, we have no other means to supplement these budgets because our debt sustainability would no longer be healthy. We can't float bonds right now because we already have reached our debt to GDP ratio. So that's something that we also look into. So maybe as a member of Insu Resilience, what we could look into is how do we make economies financially resilient against the effects of climate change? So what we have been seeing is that having a layered strategy, although it's something that we work on for many years already, is not enough to counter the effects of climate that is happening right now, especially in areas located in Southeast Asia or the Pacific. That's also um, where the uh, Marshall Islands and other member V20 countries are located. So with our experience right now, we're already um, spending for adaptation. For example, we're trying to see how much hazard mapping tools we need, how much, um, uh, how much uh, geospatial technology do we need to invest in, how much in terms of adaptation do we need to spend for purposes of um, natural uh, tools, like for example, how much mangroves do we need replanted, how much trees do we need input, while at the same time trying to come up with finances to help people in the most vulnerable sectors um, move or, or recover from what has happened to them when a typhoon strikes. So I think one of the reasons that we wanted to explore how a pool for micro, small and medium enterprises could be developed is because these highly vulnerable sector with the least amount of capitalization are also the ones who can't afford insurance products because their insurance products are more, uh, the premium prices are higher than most products because they are located in more vulnerable areas. And at the same time, their credit is not that um, big or their credit line is not that strong. So these are things that we wanted to, to, to solve as well as, for example, in certain areas of the Philippines where there are island off-grid areas, electricity is provided by electric cooperatives, which are not necessarily MSMEs, but they may also fall within the ambit of these types of um, businesses. They don't have enough capitalization or funds to rebuild um, certain, for example, electricity posts that are hit because of typhoon. So what do we do to help these types of sectors that are highly vulnerable, that are at most risk, and at the same time has to pay the highest cost of premium? So I think that's where the SIF um, facility, the study, came into being. So we wanted to know how disaster risk pools can help maybe uh, buffer some of the risks so that their premium cost for insurance wouldn't be that expensive. So I think that's one area that we could explore 
to the uh, facility. So thank you and back to you. Right. Well, right. thank you, Paola. And uh, sound was brilliant. We understood everything. So thank you very much for, for thinking so quick on your feet there uh, in resolving this technical issue. Uh, uh, moving now to, to Ibrahima. And uh, I mean, what room do you see for risk pools, sovereign risk pools, uh, that they could play uh, perhaps a more active role that could sensitize people about climate and uh, disaster risk finance and insurance as a vehicle to increase resilience to climate? Uh, and do you perhaps have examples of the, the latest developments there? Uh, Ibrahima, I would like to give the floor to you now. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you. It is a delight to be joining this platform to share the perspective from Africa. Uh, let me, uh, before I answer your question, just highlight the two aspects that really caught my attention in the Vision 2025. The one being to help uh, countries to be more resilient to climate change rather right, disasters but more importantly also to protect uh, the vulnerable people across developing countries. And I think the second part of the vision that really caught my attention is uh, the ambition to actually scale up the accessibility to innovative financing to address disaster related uh, uh, consequences actually uh, across the developing world. And the reason why they could my attention because they are at the heart of why we exist as an organization. And the question becomes, what do we do to contribute in achieving that, that vision for the next uh, couple of years? Let me start by stating the problem, which is really, unfortunately, you don't get to hear much about it when it comes to climate change, is the human impact of climate change on the African continents. In our case, actually, they do have names and that's food security because of drought, uh, because the flooding, which also affect uh, agriculture in many African countries. In other cases also is tropical cyclone and the list sort of goes on. But I think what doesn't get talked about quite often is the human aspect of these disasters. And that's precisely what we're trying to address as an organization. So the question is, what is the African response to those disasters? Obviously, Africa did not kind of stand on the side and wanted to be part of the solution. That's the reason why the African Union has created an institution called the African Risk Capacity, uh, which is basically an institution uh, that is the response that the African Union is saying, this is our contribution to addressing this uh, disaster related uh, uh, to climate change on the African continent. And the question is, what exactly do we do that can contribute to addressing this? Basically, threefold. And the best way to define it is likely plan, prepare, and response. Uh, plan in the sense in many African countries, very few actually have visibility on the level of risk with regard to disaster. And knowing your level of risk with regard to disaster allows you, in one hand, as a policymakers to take that into account into your budgeting, the national budget. And the other decision that allows you to know that risk is to transport that risk, let's say, to the insurance market so you can anticipate and get the resources required. This is extremely critical, and that's really at the heart of what we do as an institution in working with our member states to get themselves have the visibility, which eventually will allow them to make some sound decisions. The second thing that we do is really uh, to prepare these countries to respond to disasters. And when disasters strike, every single day and second counts in the lives of people you're trying to save. So therefore having a coordinated government goes to the heart of really being able to respond in a very professional manner, but it's in a very structured manner as well. And I think last but not least is really how do you respond from a financial point of view? The reality is when disasters strike, as you mobilize the international community to get some funding, you may need some resources immediately to be able to actually uh, come to the support of the communities that are affected by disasters. And that's where the response comes in. So the question is, since we've been created in 2012, what exactly have we done in terms of impact? And numbers are quite impressive, and I'm always proud to actually quote them because they really go 
it goes to the heart of the Vision 2025 of uh, uh, the partnership world that governs us today. I think number one, since we created, in terms of premium financing, we've about over $100 million uh, since 2012. In terms of payout to countries, extremely important because that payout goes to the communities that are vulnerable, about $65 million. In terms of coverage, we're talking about $720 million. And the last study set, which is the most important part, and that is the people that are being insured because of the premium financing that we're involved in. We're talking about 72 million people across Africa. Extremely impressive, but also important to why we exist as an organization. Let me finish up by two things. Number one, obviously we can do this alone. And us as an institution, we are an example that actually is smart and strategic partnership actually works. We're able to basically, in addition to our member states, about 34, be able to get the support from a number of the partners that are involved here today. Without making a big mistake, let me just make sure I name them so that we don't actually forget and make anybody unhappy. But I'm proud to say that Canada, France, Switzerland, United States, Rockefeller have been extremely supportive to what we do as well. But I cannot finish without singling out two of our partners that have played a major, major role in what we do. Let me start by KFW. Uh, through BMZ has been extremely supportive in providing premium financing in the middle of COVID-19, where most of our countries in Africa are struggling because of budget constraint to meet the premium financing needs. So I think uh, kudos to KFW. And quite frankly, beyond just the support they provided, it helped save the life of many Africans across the continent. And I want to just recognize KFW in terms of the impact that you provided. Well, I also want you. to recognize the EU for the support <laughs> you provided in building our capacities as an institution. Well, that's and the perfect bridge, Ibrahim. That's the perfect bridge. First of all, thank you so much uh, for acknowledging and appreciating uh, some of the support uh, that came uh, uh, your way or the region. So it's, it's, it's always good to hear that. Uh, it actually is effective. Uh, and you mentioned in the EU, uh, because uh, Stefano Signore there from the um, uh, European Commission is already standing by, and I would like to, to give him his five minutes, uh, if possible. Uh, Stefano, now, uh, you've just listened to the experience from the Philippines and uh, also Ibrahima there, the uh, African uh, Risk Capacity Group there. Um, listening to those and, and also the the, the best practice that they shared, but we all know that, that there are still challenges ahead. Uh, so what could be leveraged through the next, uh, yet to be agreed upon, next EU multi-annual financial framework 2021-2027, uh, in order to support the vulnerable countries and uh, fill the, the gaps of, or the gaps of need. Stefano, five minutes for you now. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to share this panel with Mr. De Jong and Ms. Alvarez uh, because of the uh, link and the cooperation that already exists amongst our uh, organization and countries. And coming to your question, we are uh, putting in place a set of instruments and approaches with the aim to increase our ability to intervene in our partner countries and in particular in those which are more vulnerable. We want to be overall more impactful and in general be able to uh, support action uh, at country level which can be more transformational. Let me uh, mention some of the elements uh, of our approach. First of all, uh, as you know, uh, this commission, the European Commission, has presented one year ago the European Green Deal, which is, let's say, our uh, growth agenda. Uh, we want to achieve uh, climate neutrality by uh, 2050, but this we will not do alone. We need for that uh, to uh, promote uh, and enhance international partnerships, and in general, the external dimension of the Green Deal for us is really an essential component of this endeavor. 
But secondly, we are also simplifying our uh, financial structure. We are moving from several funding instruments to one single instrument, which is the Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument. And with this, we want to be more uh, basically flexible, uh, ready uh, to basically um, uh, address in a more uh, comprehensive way the, the today's uh, global challenges. Uh, as a third element, we are also expanding our EU external investment plan that we have for the time being launched uh, uh, only in Africa and in, in the neighborhood in order to establish basically a guarantee capacity which will be in the area of some 53-54 billion euros in order to leverage public and private investment for sustainable development. Uh, we also want to strengthen our collaboration with EU member states, European financial institutions, with the Team Europe approach, which is giving birth to a number of initiatives in different partner countries. As you may know, the EU response to the COVID-19 global emergency was delivered through a Team Europe package, combining resources from the different EU institutions and member states. And our collective response has grown so far to almost 37 billion euros. In this Team Europe response to COVID-19, there were already some good examples where the EU is supporting, for instance, the social protection systems, which is one of the areas where, as we know, insure resilience wants to deepen cooperation. Uh, we have example in Malawi or in Bangladesh, uh, of course, the time uh, doesn't allow to go very much in details uh, in order to explain what we are doing in those countries. So we are currently translating the ambitions of the Green Deal together with the global COVID-19 response and build, build back better to support partner countries in their efforts towards more resilient, climate neutral and sustainable economies. So our aim is basically to strengthen the Team Europe approach in implementation of the next uh, multi-annual financial framework. Our EU delegations around the world have already started this work, and this will be further developed and discussed uh, uh, in the next uh, year or so. We see that climate action appears prominently in many of the proposals that have been received, as well as for disaster risk reduction, in particular in certain areas like, uh, for instance, the Pacific and the Caribbean. Finally, the last element I would like to mention is the need to leverage private sector funding in the area of climate change and disaster risk reduction. The EU is willing to play a greater role in catalyzing investment needed. We are currently investigating whether the FSD+, Plus, which is the European Fund for Sustainable Development, might be the financial tool through which to engage with partner countries in order to promote the use of financing instruments for disaster risk reduction, such as catastrophe bonds, sovereign insurance, or contingency credit lines, or simply to increase the insurance penetration in those countries and regions identified during the programming exercise. Where barriers hamper the development of insurance schemes, we could, through blending finance, technical assistance and guarantees, support the private sector to engage in countries where the commercial, political, regulatory and currency risks are too high to discourage the investment. Let me close also with the word of, of encouragement for partners. I believe it is essential that we continue this work together, improving coordination and collaboration amongst us in supporting countries in order to create virtuous synergies and complementarity. Thank you very much and back to you, Monica. Thank you so much, Stefano there. Um, I just have to keep an eye on the clock and I know everybody else hates that, but it's part of my job. We've got two minutes left and I would like to include one question that reached me now from one of our participants um, and it is to Paola. So I hope Paola, you're still with us. Um, the question is, you have enumerated that you adopt a multi-layered strategy in the Philippines. How do you coordinate the different partners in a holistic manner? Complex question. You have two minutes to answer. Paola, please activate your microphone. Okay. Uh, thank you. So for coordination, what we do is we do the budget tagging call and we also look into the gaps, also look 
needed. So, for example, for this one, we initially had the World Bank Catastrophe Deferred Drawdown Facility, but we realized after some number of typhoons and the pandemic that we actually needed um, two more. So that's that's how we we look into what else do we need in order for us to improve the layers of protection that we actually instill. So it's actually a whole of government approach. We talk to different government agencies, like for example, the budget and management department and the end users, for example, like the education department, the health department. And then we look into the gaps of what else is needed. That's how we um, know which parts of the layers we need to add on. So I think my two minutes is up. Thank you. Super, super, fantastic. I'm absolutely impressed, Paola. Thank you so much. Uh, and we're, we're spot on. Uh, of course, we could have discussed uh, further, and I'm sure there's more to explore. But as I said right at the beginning of the conference, um, this stretches over four days. So, uh, Stefano and uh, Paola and Ibrahima, uh, thank you so much for your time and for uh, sharing uh, your expertise here with us. This uh, brings us almost to the end of uh, this day one and our very first session here. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who participated actively and of course everybody else who was uh, following us uh, early in the morning, midday, evening, night, uh, because you're all around the globe. Uh, let me just give you a very, very quick uh, look ahead because uh, there are three more days uh, coming up and so you can already sort of pace yourself. Tomorrow is an interactive day. Uh, hosted by Pablo Suarez, you all remember him surely from previous uh, Inter Brazilians Global Partnership Forum. Uh, he's Associate Director for Research and Innovation at the Red Cross Crescent Climate Center. So that's going to be an interactive today, uh, day tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday, day three, we will focus on regional exchange, uh, and that means that the sessions will take place throughout the day, bringing expertise from all over the globe. So. Central European time, we start early in the morning, midday, afternoon, until late at night in order to, to meet the time zones of the regions that are joining us. And Thursday then, the final day, we will be focusing on the impact of our work and how we can strengthen resilience. So three more very busy days ahead. All the sessions, as mentioned earlier, are recorded and they will be shared on the Inter Resilience website later on. Uh, and if you're still fit, fit as a fiddle, and you would like to continue the discussion, you can do so because after a very, very short break, you see it here at 3.30 Central European time, uh, we will start with the first side event, uh, followed by the second side event. They are hosted by the uh, Global Parametrics and Care and Partners. And you can also visit our online risk talk platform. And there you can continue all the discussions and maybe open questions that we haven't had a chance uh, to address throughout the session. So make sure you make use of that, unless it's in the middle of the night and you need your beauty sleep, uh, then maybe one of the next days uh, the side session fits better into your time zone. So have uh, good constructive work if you join the Risk Talk platform. And uh, be sure to be back again uh, tomorrow and day two with uh, Pablo Suarez. I'll see you again if you want on Wednesday and on Thursday for day three and day four. Until then, stay safe.